When One Piece began its current long-term arc on the Japanese-themed island of Wano, I was already excited. The allusions to kabuki plays and the unique stylistic choices of the art for the island and the characters were really engaging and I thought they were delightful, frankly. But when the character Kumurasaki was revealed, I fell in love. I won't reveal any substantial plot spoilers in this video for the arc, and I really encourage anyone in the comments to mark if they are posting spoilers, but Komurasaki's presence and the look uh, of her outfit absolutely blew me away. She was strong, confident, beautiful, and uniquely an Oiron. I had to cosplay her, but where do you even start on something like that? Many here in the West have likely never heard of an Oiron before, or perhaps have confused Geisha and Oiron together. While I had been familiar with the premise of what an Oiron is for a decently long time and their history, I knew significantly less about their specific and unique style of kitsuke, or kimono wearing practices. So I decided to dive into this here too unknown for me world and hopefully learn some things along the way. And uh, boy have I, the world of kimono is deep and expansive and since it's basically all in Japanese, it can be really hard to keep up with if you don't speak the language. The outfit of historical oiran is wildly different from modern kimono and frankly there aren't many resources out there for this information. What is available is scattered and difficult pieced together, so I thought in the pursuit of making these resources more available for everyone in English, I'd start a series working through the making of Komurasaki's ensemble. But before that, we need to answer a couple questions. First, what is an oiran? And second, what does an oiran wear? Let's start with question one. What is an oiran? Oiran were an elite class of courtesans in Japan from the 18th through the 19th centuries, though those dates are a little fuzzy. They enjoyed a great deal of fame and prestige and marked one of the many uniquely Japanese cultural moments in history. The role of an oiran might seem kind of complicated to Western audiences. Yes, an oiran was a sex worker, but to apply the term prostitute to the profession would be reductive at best. Oiran were more like escorts to continue with Western parallels, but also this doesn't fully encapsulate the work of an oiran. Oiran were esteemed and prized for being well-educated, exceptional conversationalists, and writers talented with instruments and able to perform various traditional tasks like tea ceremonies and flower arranging. The prestige of an oiran was dependent on these skills and their beauty, and uh, oiran could rise in popularity and fame if they were talented enough. At the top of these rankings was the taiyu, who could be identified through especially elaborate and ostentatious outfits that exceeded the look of any oiran beneath them. Unlike geisha, despite popular misconceptions in the West, oiran did operate out of pleasure districts in Japan and were usually part of specific brothels. In One Piece, Komurasaki is presumably a taiyu and is identified as the last oiran in Wano. She enjoys widespread fame across Wano and wears the trappings of the highest ranks. When she makes her procession through the capital, she is part of what would have been the very traditional sort of parade oiran participated in. In the real world, these parades would have been an early form of advertising to show off the prestige and impressive abilities of the taiyu, and by extension, the whole brothel operation. In front of the taiyu would be young, assistants, usually girl children. To her side would be an assistant to support her in the extremely tall wooden shoes worn by the taiyu for these parades. Behind her would be more male attendants, variously carrying things like a parasol to keep the sun off of the taiyu. To the fore and the back of the parade would be various figures from understudy courtesans to cross-dressing figures to kitsune masked entertainers. I'll include a playlist link in the description below to all the various videos I referenced as part of my research here. With the background out of the way, let's move into the trickier part of this video, dissecting the outfit of our Oiran, Komurasaki. So before I dive in, I do want to make a couple of disclaimers. First, I believe Komurasaki is actually wearing more layers than what an Oiran would dress in in modern recreations. I'm not sure if there's been an attempt to simplify the layers for reenactors or if Komurasaki is just extra dressed up, but many of these layers can still be applicable to Oiran in general. And second, a lot of this is conjecture and guessing based on the information I've been able to gather. I've had to rely on various websites, Wikipedia, YouTube resources, and books to pull all of this together, so some of it might be of dubious veracity, but I hope that it is still informational enough and overall truthful. 
especially my conjecture is about what the layers of the garment are and what they are called. All of the names I mention are real things and could exist in an outfit, but may or may not be reasonable with these specific circumstances. I hope that any future viewers may look at this video with understanding when more sources inevitably arrive on the subject. With all that said though, let's peel back the layers of this Oiron outfit. At the very base of this outfit would be the unseen Harajuban layer. This could be a single piece or split into a top and a skirt. If the garment is split in two, then the skirt is called a susiyoke. This garment has small, simple round sleeves, no collar, and is like the equivalent of the Western chemise. This layer is usually white and made of cotton or potentially a form of hemp. On top of this would be the first visible layer of the kimono ensemble, the nagajuban. You might notice that both of these words have the same base. Juban originally comes from a foreign Portuguese word and is used for many of the various kimono undergarments. The Naga Juban is a single piece garment that is worn so that only the collar and potentially the edges of the sleeves are visible. In a normal kimono ensemble, this and the outer kimono would comprise basically the entire outfit. The Nagajuban can also be a two-part garment called a Hanjuban and once again a Susuyoke. Historically, this garment would have been worn as such in two pieces with the one-piece Nagajuban being a later evolution of the style. Traditionally, this garment would have been made in red with a white collar or in pure white and it could have been made out of a variety of materials from cotton to silk to hemp, depending on the formality of the kimono it's paired with. It's meant to sit a little bit shorter than the main kimono garment and is usually worn about mid ankle length. The Naga Juban is also worn with a Han Eri, which is basically a secondary piece of fabric sewn over the collar to protect the permanent collar from getting sweaty and discolored, kind of like Victorian dust ruffles protecting skirts from getting permanently discolored. The Han Eri also serves a secondary purpose as the sleeve for what's called an Eri Shin or a collar stiffener. Because kimono are pulled down some in the back and are layered, the stiffness of the airy shin, which is modernly made of plastic, helps reinforce the collar and keep its crisp shape as other layers are added on top of it. The nagajuban is also helped with what's called an imonuki, which helps keep the collar from riding up in the back. There's a bunch of different ways to make juban, from a built-in collar to a floating collar, kind of like a dicky, having it be lined or unlined, the collar being full or half width, and more. Collar width is determined by the formality of the garment, with full width collars needing to be folded in towards the body for wear, and informal half width collars being ready to wear without further modification. Most commonly, you see unlined half width collar nagajuban. For Kamarasaki, the red inner layer next to her neck would be the nagajuban layer, with the red at the collar most likely being a haneri. I feel pretty much 100% confident about those layers, but then we start getting into what is more murky territory. The next layer of Kamurasaki's outfit is a white kimono garment that could be called a few different things. Billy Matsunaga, in her video on the history of kimono underwear, mentions a garment that isn't frequently used anymore called a shitagasane, uh, which I probably butchered. This was basically just a second kimono worn underneath that matched the outer kimono in its formality, meaning its tailoring materials and sleeve length would be approximately the same. This layer would not, I think, be worn folded up like the outer kimono is and would likely have been tailored to sit at an appropriate level without that alteration. Since this layer can be seen both at the sleeves and the bottom of the outfit in some reference pictures, it would make sense that this is what this garment is. I've also read a term for a similar garment called a donuki, which was a type of under kimono usually sold in a set with the outer kimono and was designed to reserve valuable fabric for the parts of the kimono that were visible, like the collar, bottom of the hem, and the sleeves. I'm not sure if this is classified as an entirely different garment or is a specialized type of shitagasane, but those could both be applicable here, I think. Up next is another contentious part of this ensemble for a number of reasons. The pink second collar over the white layer doesn't show up in all of her reference images and is not included in the model from the show itself. However, it does show up in various promo images, references, and in images of her from the app game Treasure Cruise. In the interest of being complete, I'm choosing to include this in my build as well. I think this layer could be classified as a hyoku or a second wing by translation. The hyoku modernly can also be used to describe the strip of fabric added to formal kimono to replace the shitagasane, but I'm pretty sure it also applies to the faux undergarment worn by figures like geisha and in kabuki theater. Hyoku can be a means to reduce weight on the otherwise hefty outfits of these performers and for 
modesty purposes. The Hyoku comes in a few parts, one being a faux second skirt, usually sewn within the outer kimono. Since some styles of kimono part in the front and geisha often have to lift the hem of their kimono to walk, the Hyoku creates the illusion of another kimono skirt at a manageable length underneath. This underskirt is usually sewn horizontally along the back. Another potential part of the hyoku are the faux collar and sleeves layered underneath the outer kimono. The collar could be an entirely separate piece or could be attached to the back of the outer collar and left floating the rest of the way down. The very thick under collar seen on geisha, I believe, is an example of this part of the hyoku. Various parts of the hyoku can be taken without using all of them as well. Uh, hyoku could be confused with a dataeri, but is, I'm pretty sure, different. Dataeri are another kimono layer accessory, but unlike Hyoku, Date Eri follow the lines of the outer kimono they are layered with, peeking out along the collar past where they overlap, whereas the Hyoku sits underneath the outer kimono completely. Given that the pink collar on Kumarasaki only shows up at the neckline and isn't visible at the sleeves or the hem, I think it's highly likely this layer would have been a Hyoku collar added over top of the layers beneath. And we finally reached the outermost layer of the kimono ensemble. I believe that this is a hikizuri kimono, which I've also sometimes seen called a susuhiki or a susihiki. This is a special type of kimono worn differently from regular styles of kimono, which require a visible uhashori or a fold from where the kimono was brought up and tied in place. Instead, this kimono is tied at an angle to create a fold back of the front panel of the kimono called the okumi to reveal a decorative lining and is secured with a red wrap called a momi. This type of kimono also features a floor trailing length, usually with a padded hem to help the skirt flare out as it's worn and trail the ground more elegantly. Hikizuri, I believe, could have two rolls of padding, but could also potentially only have one, though I have seen instances of trained kimonos without padding as well. Modernly, hikizuri are pretty much only worn by geisha and in kabuki theater. This type of kimono is stylistically almost the exact same to a kakeshite kimono, but based on what I have seen and read, hikizuri have a similar sleeve length to normal formal women's sleeve length, whereas kakeshita have sleeves at a furasode length. Based on the reference images, Komarasaki clearly has a shorter sleeve length. Higizuri and Kakeshita style kimonos are also constructed differently than regular kimono due to their unique style of wear. The collar of these types of kimono are shorter than normal, while the length of the kimono body is much longer. The sleeves of these kimono are also offset slightly to accommodate the collar being set much deeper into the back of the kimono and pulled farther down when worn. The sleeves of these kimono are also offset slightly to accommodate the collar being set much deeper into the back of the kimono and pulled down further when worn. My battery just died and I spent the last like 45 minutes looking for my battery charger. So if the frame looks a little bit different, ignore that. So we are going to move on to obi now, uh, since we've finished talking about the primary kimono layers. Obi are the various styles of decorative belts necessary to wear kimono. On normal kimono, they are worn towards the back of the garment, but uniquely, oiran wear them tied at the front, likely a reference to their erotic occupation. Traditionally, oiran wear a style of obi called, and I'm going to butcher this, manaita obi, which roughly translates to chopping board obi due to the wide flat nature of the masubi or not shape. This style of obi is basically exclusive to the oiran and features copious decorations along the front to emphasize the wealth and prestige of the oiran. Manaita obi are worn at full width as opposed to the informal half width obi or modified obi like the Nagoya obi. They also appear to forego a great deal of the visible accessories of the obi like the obiage or the obidome. During Komarasaki's parade debut, she wears the style of obi with a peacock on the front. However, during other scenes, such as a banquet, she wears another type of obi. For a long time, I thought this obi was basically a fantasy made up by One Piece's creator, Ichiro Oda, but after doing too many late night Google rabbit hole searches for this series and for this video, I found an obi that looked shockingly similar. Now seen almost exclusively on stage in Kabuki, this type of bow looked eerily close to Kumarasaki's. I reached out to Billy Matsunaga about this, which by the way, she's been an absolutely invaluable source of information through all of this for script writing and has been extraordinarily patient. Like, oh my God, this woman is a saint. So please go check her out uh, for information about kimono if you're interested in more of that. Anyway though, she informed me that this style of obi knot is a historical style called Kichiya Musubi 
uh, which after looking into it, it appears that the style of obi can be worn shorter or quite long as a bow though it is not especially tied to oiron and is usually worn at the back like regular obi. With the obi question solved, there's only one garment left, the unique outer kimono-like garment kumarasaki and all oiron wear, which is called an uchikake. This is basically a highly formal overcoat worn on top of kimono, which has a padded hem like the higizori kimono and trail to the ground. This garment is worn unbelted and oftentimes open completely, but can be partially closed as I've seen in a number of images with a type of Korin belt, aka an elastic belt with clips on either end. Modernly, the uchikake is seen most frequently with furisode link sleeves, but historically the sleeve length could vary according to the type of kimono worn with it. These outer garments have a very similar construction to regular kimono as far as I can tell, just with wider panels to accommodate the layers underneath and substantially more decoration. Lengthwise, it stretches just a bit farther than the train of the kimono underneath. These garments are now usually only seen again in kabuki and traditional styles of Japanese wedding ceremonies. And that's all the layers. Some of these might be debatable or not seen on real oiron, but I really tried my best to pull together all of the information I could on this. Again, I really can't thank Billy Matsunage enough for the wealth of information on her YouTube channel and Instagram. Go check her out if you want to see more kimono information or just fun videos in general. If you have sources with information I missed, please drop them in the comments. I'd love to know more. And if you want more, I'll be starting on the juban layers of this kimono very soon. Thanks so much for watching and if if you want a more stable reference for this video, I'll be putting the script to this video with some images up on my Patreon for free for anyone who wants to reference it. A link to that will also be in the description. Uh, thanks again, y'all. Bye!